But clearly, as we as we together in 2012, never, certainly in my 30 plus years in the energy industry, has the debate around energy security, and of course clean energy security, ever been greater than it is today. Uh, and, and the company that I lead, National Grid, sit at the heart of this challenge in the UK. We join everything up. So the role that we have to play today and for the next 10, 15 years in joining up new sources of energy to make sure that we do have electricity and gas in our homes and in our businesses every day is a really huge challenge. Over £200 billion of expenditures required in the UK in the next 10 years. A lot of that obviously is replacing our power stations that are shutting down. But we've submitted to Ofgem, the regulator in the UK, plans that will have us investing £45 billion over the, over the eight years from 2013 to 2021. Now, an enormous investment programme. Ofgem, to their credit, have changed the form of regulation, adjusted it, re a new form of regulation, but at the heart of which is, can you incentivise this step up an investment and ensure these businesses are still efficient? We are halfway through the process of agreeing the outcome of Rio that will then allow National Grid to get on with this enormous investment program. What we've got to get right and balance though is the affordability, what all of us as customers in the UK can afford, with of course the need to make sure that investment flows in, in into these businesses. That's a balancing out. We've got to get that right this year. And it's a critical year because if we don't invest in the transmission systems in the UK in the next eight years, the real vision of 2050 and the green economy, I'm afraid, is gone. This is the era in which we've got to reinforce and build those big transmission systems. Having got the framework right, having got the incentives in place to ensure this investment starts, that's not the end of it, of course. You know, we have a huge challenge with planning permission in the UK. Public acceptability. The ability of local communities to allow us to build transmission systems. And of course, there's an enormous discussion about how much of that should be underground versus overground. Uh, and it's very clear it is going to be a specific case-by-case -case analysis of getting the balance again between cost and visual amenity, what people want to look at their local environment right. And those costs are socialised across the UK, so there's still a complex road to run in terms of ensuring we build these systems. And I'm constantly talking about skills as well. We need to hire two and a half thousand highly skilled, predominantly engineers over the next eight years to help in this huge construction programme. And the UK education system is not producing the quality and quantity of skills that we need it today. The other interesting aspect here, of course, is when people talk about, oh, you're building, particularly overhead lines, transmission systems that look visually an awful lot like what was put up in the 1960s. The technology has moved on enormously. You know, these are very different pieces of technology than the system we put up in the 1960s. And it needs to be because the transmission system, as we go beyond 2020, the dynamic way in which it needs to balance renewables the power flows around the UK are very different to the system that we own and operate today. In a world in which a significant percentage of our electricity is generated from large nuclear power stations and a lot of renewable energy, we need a bulk transmission system to deliver that power to our homes and our, and our businesses. But in the future there will unquestionably be a significant increase in embedded generation, local generation, so the distribution systems and the transmission systems of the future have to be a lot smarter than they are today. People talk a lot about smart meters, but smart meters is only one part of a smarter system that we will need in the future. Today, we consume electricity at the flick of a switch when we want it. The future, we need to move to a world in which we consume a lot of that when it is at its cheapest, when the wind is blowing very strongly. So moving from a demand-led world to a supply-led world is a huge transition. But we have time to do this. You know, we're talking now about 20, 30 years out. And the challenge for government and for businesses is to plot this trajectory, get the investments incentivised and in place, but in place at the right time as well. Not too early when we can't really get the benefits of some of those investments. So we do need a much smarter network system, much smarter homes, 
if we're to really get the benefits of renewable energy, electric transportation, ground source heat pumps in our homes, but it's a journey, it's not 2015, you know, this is the vision 2030 and beyond. And the exciting and challenging part of this is planning that investment today against the scenario of the future, but pacing it appropriately as well. In addition to the £45 billion pounds that we need to run and invest in the major transmission systems in the UK in the next eight years, there are other investment opportunities for us as a business and for others in the UK. Carbon capture and storage, the networks associated with that is something that we're, that we're looking very hard at. How can we minimise the amount of network that requires to be built by hubbing a lot of those plants around a central piece of infrastructure? A question, obviously, an opportunity. Offshore networks. How do we make sure in the UK that we don't build lots of point-to-point -point connections to the shore, which the current regime incentivises, perversely, 60 landing points around the UK, when we could get away with 30 and reduce the cost for customers by something of the order of four to eight billion pounds in total. Something we definitely need to look at. And of course, linking that into mainland Europe. Is that the backbone of a supergrid with Northwest Europe for the future? Well, so a lot of new opportunities there. And on the gas side, how much more LNG import facility does the UK need? Certainly National Grid's LNG terminal at the Isle of Grain, we're very keen to put a fourth phase expansion in there. At that stage, we're getting up to half, over half of the UK's gas being able to come in as LNG. I suspect that's probably enough for a, a period of time, but out beyond there, probably more LNG import facilities as well. So beyond the core networks business, a lot of other energy related opportunities in the next 10 years.